the most effective people in our craft, and I think this is true of mm -hmm. most jobs, are people that have insatiable, insatiable curiosity. This is gonna change some aspects of our job in the future, and we're all gonna do the best we can to make sure that those changes are positive changes. Um, but, but you know, the reality is... What's the goal, the, the goal in AI model? Yeah. What, where, okay. Well, this, this, this is this paint is us a example. picture. Paint us a picture. This, well, that's an example where I don't have the answers yet. Um, <laughs> that's probably, probably the right answer. To yeah, figure them out. Yeah, it probably yeah. is. Um, I, I do think, I do think directionally, we know that um, one first and foremost. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Makes You Wonder, where I, Oscar Surrender, discuss the future of human creativity in the age of AI, with people from different perspectives on art, creativity, and technology. We'd love for you to follow along the show, so please hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening or watching this. We are available on all the major platforms, so take your pick and follow us along starting now. And joining me today in a conversation is Jeff Beringer. He is the newly appointed Chief AI Officer at Golan, an award-winning PR and communications agency with 50 offices around the world and 1,600 employees in a long list of awards on their shelves. They have a very interesting take on AI and are really going all in on it. Their CEO, Matt Beal, declared that their goal is for Golan to be the first fully AI integrated global PR agency. And after hearing more about Jeff's background, it seems he was really made for this role after a long career building the digital practice at Golan. So it makes you wonder a lot of things. What does a PR and communications agency do with AI? How do they apply that to clients in creativity and in work processes? And what does a chief AI officer do? Here's my conversation with Jeff Beringer. Before we begin and dive into everything that's obviously your title is going to just make people very curious about uh, everything about you. So we're going to get to that. But where uh, where do we find you today? Where tell tell our viewers and listeners here where where is Jeff in the world? I'm in uh, I'm in rainy Dallas, Texas, actually a suburb just north of it. Um, today's a remote work day um, after a couple days down in our office in uh, in the middle of Dallas. So I'm in I'm in Texas. Nice. Yeah. All right. So, how, so what, what's the, uh, what's the goal in work situation, work from home, going to the office situation? Yeah, we, um, we've always <laughs> had a, um, a pretty flexible, um, working policy. Um, obviously during, during COVID everybody was remote for a very yeah. long time. Um, we found though that we've lost some things in, uh, in going remote too much. And so now, um, we, we typically have employees coming in at least two or three days into our, uh, into our offices. Of course, we've also got a lot of people that work in offices that are fully remote that we hired during COVID too. So they're, they're coming in for key meetings and so on. So, but generally people are in the office two or three days a week. Um, mm -hmm. but it, but it kind of varies by person and role. It seems like that is kind of become the new norm, right? Yeah. A couple of days a week, uh, the standard, I work a lot from home and we were, we're, we're distributed quite well, but we have an office in, in London in Soho where Alex yeah. is. Um, and I feel like you, you kind of need to have a combination of it. You need to come together as humans. Yeah. I feel, I, I feel like I took a complete 180 during COVID. I'm like, everyone's going to work from home now for, yeah. for eternity. Um, but then I came full circle and like, you, you really miss being yeah. with people. So it's good. Yeah. To have I, mean, I don't know about you, but I, I, I found, um, we all got really productive during, yeah during lockdown, but I don't know if we were quite as effective and just the, the moments of people being together and the things that you can only do sometimes in person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We missed some of that. So we're getting back right. to it, but, but appropriately, you know, the right. Balance. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Jeff, so happy to have you on the show. Um, Thanks. it's, it's really an honor and I'm really excited to dig into this. You are chief AI officer, which I think is, um, a very a, a title over times in many ways, right? And kind of leading the way on on this area. Um, I think we see a lot of agencies and companies uh, following suit, which is really interesting and exciting. Um, and I know you have kids, you have a family. What do you tell your family and children what you do at work all day? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, first, I, I, I work in public relations, and 
oftentimes when you tell people you work in public relations, you have to explain that it's not advertising and how it's different from advertising. So, um, so I work in an agency where uh, clients hire us primarily to earn attention and they hire us to do that. Uh, we say that we've got a very simple purpose for clients, uh, that we were hired to basically create change that matters for them. And that, that change is sometimes, you know, creating demand for a new product or improving a company's reputation. We do a lot of different things in, in public relations, but in our simplest form, the agency I work for and the work we do for clients, it's always about trying to create positive change. So the way that we make positive change is being changed really quickly by AI. And it's, it's changing how our people get our work done. Mm -hmm. And so my job as, as chief AI officer, and I'm, I'm new into this role. I've been working in AI for the last couple of years, as have many people mm -hmm. um, in marketing and comms. Um, but I'm, I'm focusing all my time and, and attention here because this is changing how we're working so fundamentally and it's happening really fast. And so my job is really about supporting uh, and empowering my colleagues in our agency. We've got 15, 1600 people around the world in 50 different offices. And my job is to empower them to do the best work of their lives using technology that is assisting us to do it. And um, every day is different in this, in this new role I'm in, as I'm, I'm figuring out, sometimes my focus <laughs> yeah. is on, you know, finding the right tools that can help people do their work better and figure out how we implement those tools into our day-to-day -day processes. Um, sometimes it's about training people how to use those tools to do something in their work. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's, it's um, figuring out how our business model or our agency's organizational structure is going to need to evolve um, mm -hmm. as our client relationships evolve and as they change the way they work inside their organizations. What is sort of the future of our agency look like. So my job is really about empowering people and uh, making sure we're, we're uh, as an organization fit for the future. And, and so that's, that's kind of at the center of it. That's a good answer to your children. Uh, now your children are a little older and I'm yeah. sure they're super wise and proud of you. So I think that's a good they're answer. They're using AI already. <laughs> oh yeah, of course, of course. Probably running laps around you already and yeah. teaching you how to do it. <laughs> uh, we're going to get into all of that. I, re I really, it's, you have such a fascinating role and such a fascinating background. And it's so easy to tell just by how you answer that question, how, about, how much passion you have uh, for, for your work and, and your, your career and how you got there. So I want to learn more about that. But if you look at, you know, you, you can't really have a career like yours. We have having a deep passion for what you do, I guess. But what are some what are some things that you are passionate about outside of your career? Is there such a thing? Is it time for that? Or um... Yeah, no, no, no. Um, I. I, I am I am the primary uh, maker of dinner in my household. My wife, right. my wife covers so many other things in our in our uh, family, but um, I've had the the uh, pleasure of of being the head chef in my house for a long time. So I've been trying to hone that craft for years and years and years. I'm still not as good at it as I want. Uh, we moved to Texas 20 years ago, so part of that part of moving uh, to Texas and living in the state is learning how to smoke every variety of food you can. So I'm getting a little bit better at that as the years go by. Um, but, uh, but no, I, um, I enjoy, I enjoy uh, exploring different cuisines and, and, you know, new ways to make, make great meals for uh, my friends and family. Um, I try to do as much travel as I can. The first 15 years of my career, I spent most of it in airports. And it All right. was, um, yeah, it was great to be able to go around the world and work with colleagues and, you know, discover yeah. new cultures and get inspired and COVID hit. And of course, none of us were traveling anymore and, mm. and we don't travel like we used to. And I miss that. Um, but I still try to get out as often as I can to see clients in, in different locations mm. and meet with our people in different offices. It's just so much you learn simply by getting out of your own zip code. Yeah. I mean, that just that inspiration from just change of perspective, change of yeah. scenery makes all the difference, right? And I think that's probably important for anything, any any job where you have to be creative and, and uh, op be open-minded that way. Yeah, 50 yeah. offices around the world. You're in so many nooks and crannies of this beautiful earth, I guess. Yeah. Where? Um, so how much, do you, how much do you travel now? Is it um, is that a rotation that you do now in your new role? You have to go out and kind of evangelize a new role in the, yeah. in the mission that you yeah, have I mean, within it's, Technology Night? It's funny, the last couple of years... I've already been doing that. So, you know, my, my, my role is officially quite new, but um, some aspects of it I've been doing for the last two years quite a bit. Um, yeah, getting out, it, it's, it's interesting with AI, we're teaching people 
you know, we're not just giving them new tools. We, we have to teach them how to work differently mm-hmm. and sort of inspire them and get them excited about trying new ways to get their job done. And, you know, as, as you can imagine, we've developed lots and lots of content and built intranet sites and sent lots of emails with how to's and video learning and all that. But really the unlock for us is when we can get people in a room and mm-hmm. work together and put hands mm-hmm. on keyboards and show them, um, uh, you know, what, what's possible with, um, with the technologies that are already available or coming soon. Mm-hmm. And so I'm doing more and more of that work, mm-hmm. um, just getting into our offices and also working with clients. We spent la- last year, I think I, I was in 40 or 50 different workshops that we led with clients, you know, oh, nice. part of the year was around, um, education and inspiration mm-hmm. and it's changed. This year is entirely about implementation. How can we together, an agency and a client begin to use AI safely to change how we work and get to better results. Um, so mm-hmm. we're really focused on the application of AI in our in our day to day work clients now. And and you know the best way to do that is sometimes to get in a room with them and and to work together on it. I mean, I'm very very interested in how that has progressed in just the near uh, near term. Like you said over a year. When I mean, the idea of applying AI is not that. Uh, old for uh, for most organizations, right? You've been working with AI, and certainly in some fields, you've been touching AI in uh, for for many years, right? But um, OpenAI in 2022 was really the, the starting block for a lot of that. But let, let's start a little bit. I want to hear more of the story, like yeah. leading into this, because I think there is a AI is probably one of quite a few paradigm shifts almost through that's been kind of coming in throughout your career. Yeah. And I'm thinking about just going back to, so 20 years ago, this is 2004. This is when I was, you know, my college coming to an end. I was trying to get out there and, you know, 2004 was that blogging was a big thing. YouTube came out in 2004, right? Twitter in 06 or something like right. that. Things were starting to happen. Coming out of the dot-com bubble, um, which is an interesting, was a hype phase, right? But then kind of normalized what digital media is. A lot of things happening there, um, and you started then the digital practice at Golan. There's okay. there's a lot to unbundle there, right? Yeah. But how just to start off, how was if you go back to 2004? What was? Can you remember what how what your approach was and and sure. how you um, how you kind of went about starting out? What was the yeah, first kind good, of? That's a good question. Let me shovel in the ground. How, how sharp my memory is. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because I, I'm, I'm in this new role. I'm looking back to previous phases of kind of transformation or evolution and trying to remember what did we learn in each of those phases that I can apply to my uh, to my new role. Um, I got started in the early days of, of Internet marketing. I was um, I started my career as a in, in media relations work at uh, one of our sister agencies as part of Interpublic Group and early days of the Internet some of our clients began to, to ask about this thing called the World Wide Web and would it, be a, <laughs> a, would it be an avenue for them to start sharing some of their stories that we're communicating with the media today and, and so on. And a lot of us, you know, nobody really had the answers, <clears throat> excuse me, in the very early days, mm-hmm. um, but I was intrigued by it as well. And I raised my hand early um, and said, I don't have the answers yet either, but I think we can figure them out together and I want to be your partner in this. And so I was one of the the couple of earliest practitioners um, in in digital at my previous firm, and um, and and then was able to meet some people at my current agency, and and fell in love with the culture, and and the size was just right to be able to innovate and try new things, and you know turn a global agency in a different direction as 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 the world evolved around us, um, and moved over to. I became the first digital employee at this agency about 20 years ago. And so for the last, you know, 18, 19 years, um, I've been, I've been heading up, um, the transformation of our services, you know, obviously for a long time, and we still a big part of what we do is, is media relations work for, for brands, but increasingly, you know, not just digital publishing and own channels, um, is important, but, uh, the rise of social media, navigating that, um, influencer marketing, you know, the, the role of data and communications to be more precise. All of that are things that we've had to figure out as as tools and technology changes and upskill and reskill and bring in new talent and change the way we work, usually for the better. So you basically raising your hand in that. I, I can take this on. 
Like that is, you remember yeah. the moment when that happened? Was it a literal yeah, race of your hand? Naive, I do, I do, and I and there was somebody at my my prior agency um, who knew I was interested in it and um, knew that I had a curiosity and that I would do the legwork to go learn as fast uh, as I could, as much as I could, and had faith to allow me to go out and explore this and turn right. it into something that would be valuable to my agency. Um, same experience that I've had the company I'm at now for the last 20 years. I've had people around me um, that have 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 given me the freedom to explore new opportunities for not just myself, but our whole agency and find ways that we can add value to what we do for clients. And sometimes that path to, you know, the the commercial impact of what you do from innovation isn't always clear. And you have to have a little faith that mm -hmm. and give people a little runway to find new things, bring new things to life and so on. But I've, I've been fortunate to, to work in a company and with people that allow you to do that kind of exploration. So curiosity, it's funny, our, our founder that uh, Al Golan is the guy who founded our yeah, agency right. 70 plus years ago. He's, he's one of, you know, three people that are really kind of the, 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 the founders of modern public relations. Mm -hmm. And um, he passed a few years ago, but Al was, um, Al was ahead of his time in so many ways. And, um, and one of the things he um, was famous for saying in our agency is that the most effective people in our craft, and I think this is true of most jobs, are people that have insatiable, insatiable curiosity. And if you have curiosity, um, certainly in our, in our role where, you know, we've got to communicate at the speed of the new cycle and in culture and what people care about, you know, staying curious to stay relevant um, is important, but it's never been, um, that, that curiosity has never at least served me better than in times of big change, you know, the, the, the rise of social media, you know, you mentioned, you know, bloggers back in the day and, and us figuring out how do we work with citizen journalists as brands and, and so on. Um, curiosity is, has propelled uh, a lot of what we do in an agency um, and as, as client in client organizations as well. And, and curiosity is, is just the key, I think, uh, to success, especially in the, in the industry I work in. It sounds like that's a very personal trait that you've obviously have harnessed. I mean, that yeah, curiosity. I've always been told to ask too many questions. <laughs> but would you imagine being a chief AI officer if you haven't raised your hand that you know twenty years ago? Um, no, no. Uh, I, you know, I, I, uh, I've taken on this role in part because I raised my hand. And right. um, there were a number of us a couple of years ago in the agency that started to see the changes that were happening around us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we started small. We, uh, we started with a small incubator, looking at some of the earliest technologies and sort of exploring, hmm, how could we use these in what we do every day? Uh, but from there, we began to build more structure and invite more people into the agency into it. You know, at, at, you know a few months in uh, to our early exploration, we had 40 people around the world as part of a steering committee. Um, we had evaluated, I think we had hands on keyboards with 90 different technologies last year, evaluating how different things could be used in our work. Um, but really it, it was a handful of us that were sort of raising our hands saying, this is important. We see value in this. And we were doing some of this work on top of our day jobs because we saw the opportunity. We still had other responsibilities to do, but we saw this as not something that was just personally interesting, which it has been and will continue to be, uh, but something we individually saw promise in and making those choices to spend some extra time in these areas um, then can turn into careers. And that's happened to me three or four times in my career where I've raised my hand about something I'm interested in and maybe the organization hasn't totally figured it out yet or committed to investing in it in a big way. But that early curiosity led to those kinds of investments and focus that allow us to do really great things. Where does that come from? Where does the curiosity come from? Is that something you knew from, you know, always as a kid? Were you that kind of kid who's kind of picking things apart or asking too many questions? And yeah, yeah, my dad, was an, <laughs> my dad was an architect. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest, and so I, um, I grew up on my Saturdays were spent on job sites of buildings mm -hmm. that you know only existed in his mind once, and we could see these things being constructed. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I grew up with. Uh, um, with, with that sort of creativity around me and seeing things get built. And I always wanted to understand how the process of how things got built, you know, because my dad was, was doing that kind of work. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, early, early days of, of, you know, personal computers and things like that, 
you know, I remember the day when I was, I don't know what it was, maybe nine years old or something like that, where my dad came home with the first Macintosh computer. Mm-hmm. And it was a big investment for a, you know, middle-class family back then. And, uh, but it was, it was something that sort of, uh, piqued my curiosity and what technology could do even as a kid. Mm-hmm. And I spent a lot of time, um, you know, learning, you know, basic programming techniques and those things just on my own because I was interested in it. And, you know, it's funny because those things as a kid at nine or 10 years old, I didn't know it at the time, but would influence what I would do later in my career. Um, you know, just, just interest in technology and how it changes people's lives and what you can do with it. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 I think we're, start, yeah. we start, we, we're starting to see a pattern here, Jeff. We start to see what you're doing. All right, let, let's break this down a little bit. You're starting in 2004. The next, I mean, I guess the next big wave was kind of introduction to social media. A lot of a lot of these technologies for the for these 20 years that you've been building this digital practice has been very disruptive in communication, right? How it changed how we view, how we how companies communicate, how we communicate with each other. Obviously, I mean, just the iPhone 2007. It's no longer a phone, no longer a flip phone. You have a little computer in your pocket. And now certainly you have a little mini MacBook in your pocket, right? It's not a phone anymore. Okay, so talk us through social media. What were the things that you ran into that was challenging? And are there things you would have done completely different during those times sitting with clients? And did you have that kind of the same approach that you have with AI now where you are learning and iterating? How, how did you approach all these big paradigm I call them paradigm shifts. I think social media is a paradigm shift. The phone, um, and um, and and now AI. But yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I there have been a lot of lessons along the way. I think we did some things right in some of those periods of transition or, or evolution, and some things that we could have done differently or better. Um, I I think we did our best work and made the most progress inside the companies I worked for, or even with client partners. Um, when we came in with a little bit of humility during these times of change and we're up front with everybody involved that nobody, including us, had all the answers. And I think, you know, especially in the world of technology and especially around sort of hype cycles, you know, there is that certainly around AI right now. Um, there was that not too long ago about the metaverse. Um, people can get really excited and, um, suggest that they may know where all this will go or that they have all the answers. And what I've found just in the three or four big, big periods of, of evolution in my own career is that when we are honest and upfront that we don't have all the answers with the key people we're working with, um, it sets the conditions where people are open to exploring things, not being afraid. Uh, to admit when they're wrong or something didn't work out um, as well as you expected. And you can course correct and move on and get better and make progress faster. And so that that sort of humility is, to me, a, a key part of, of innovation. You know, recognizing that you don't have all the answers yet, but you're going to work really hard to get them and making sure that, you know, you're upfront and transparent with people with what you do know, what you have actually done and what you haven't and what's still ahead. Uh, that, that's one thing I think I've I've learned that, um, is helpful during these these times of transition for sure. Can you recall any any big missteps that clients did during this phase who were early in? Uh, social media is a good example. I, I bet. Yeah, I mean, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I there are lots of horror stories along the way from social media. We all we all made missteps steps in the in the early days. For, sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, I I don't think necessarily in in the early days of social. It, that we, we always brought everyone along in the right way. And that's something I'm trying to do differently as we transition, at least in our agency with AI. Um, in, in, you know, in social, you oftentimes had a few people in an organization or an agency that got really smart about it. And all of that work would be sort of centralized around them. It's not that way now. Now there's lots mm-hmm. of people that touch it or are involved in it. Mm-hmm. But I think in the early days of, of social media, we could have probably done a better job creating sort of a bigger tent and bringing different stakeholders from organizations in to educate them and under, you know, so they understand why this is important and also what their role is in the change and in, in embracing it. Same thing with, with AI today. You know, we can, we have people that are more um, savvy from a technology standpoint inside of our organization and we're hiring more of those people today. But there are also people in non-technical roles 
that are, are pivotal to us really getting to the change that matters inside of our organization. If we don't bring all everyone along, um, we're not going to be as, as successful and get to the get to the place where we want to be in the next couple of years as a as an organization. So that's that's one thing I think we we need to do really well is 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 just be inclusive in in transformation and making sure everybody knows what their role is in the change and that nobody's going to be left behind. That's something, especially with AI, when people are worried about you know, what does this mean for my job as, as machines can do certain things that we do? They're never, it's never going to do everything that we do by a long shot, but people have concerns about that. And, and, you know, I think we need to be as leaders, very honest that the world around us has always been changing. This is going to change some aspects of our job in the future. And we're all going to do the best we can to make sure that those changes are positive changes. Um, but, but, you know, the reality is people's jobs will absolutely change in the next few years. And my hope is, and we're already starting to see this in our organization, it's still early days that when people have great technology and they're trained how to use it, they can spend more of their time doing more impactful work that frankly makes them happier. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that to me is the, is the biggest sort of opportunity around AI. If we get this right in terms of implementing it in our day-to-day work, is that people can be more fulfilled in what they do, spend less time on busy work and things that they don't love, and um, and more time on things that are impactful that they're proud of at the end. It gets them to better work because you know at the end of the day, most people go to work because they want to create something or do something important and do something good or great. And and I think if we get this right in an organization like mine, people are going to be a lot happier in, in the job they're doing because they're going to be doing even better work than they've ever been able to do before. I think about this. I don't know if you've seen this meme. I don't know who started this from the beginning, actually, but it's been floating around the internet. It's basically now there's AI to do all my creative work, my writing, and my productivity. But where are the where's AI that does my dishes and cleans my clothes yeah. and and <laughs> figure that out? Um, I mean, going. what you just said is like is a pretty common stance, right? And I, I like that optimism in that. I I hold the same kind of optimism. I think this is kind of um, I guess raising the the lower level of what we can do and 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 creatives and art will still sit on top of that and the that kind of human desire to create and ai is not doing that uh, just yet talk about curiosity ai is not a curious being yet right like humans are yeah um but given all these experiences that you've had throughout all these areas right for the past 20 years and beyond do you think that what we're now seeing with generative ai if we just define this period we're in right now, kind of, um, as a, is that a similar change to other technologies you've seen like social media and mobile phone, all these other things, or does this feel different in some way? I think uh, there are similarities, but I think on the whole it's, it's different. Um, just the, the, um, the applications for AI across what we do. I look at my agency, social media impacted certain parts of our company and certain people in certain kinds of roles. Um, what we're finding already, again, early days, is that new tools and technologies are making everybody's job better. Um, it's, it's, it's assistive to everything we do, whether you're a planner or a creative, a content developer, a media relations person, an analyst, whatever you do, you could be an account manager and AI is helping you do that work better. Um, people on our finance team, uh, you know, everybody in our organization is starting to realize that there's something in this for everyone. And I, I think in, in previous phases of, 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 of innovation, um, there have been, there have been people that have benefited from those tools a lot more than others or those, those periods of innovation more than others. This is, this is different where I think it, it's, we're going to, we're already seeing it. Just in the last couple of years since everybody started to pay attention when Chat GPT came to life, um, just the number of new applications for different aspects, not just of your business life, but of your personal life that are possible, it's, it's different. I just took a, um, I took a vacation with my family. My oldest is going to college soon. So our family unit's changing. And before he, um, he's headed off to college, I, the five of us, um, went to Europe and went to some places we've never been before and places where we don't speak the language. And mm -hmm. this was shortly after ChatGPT 4.0 was released. Right. And, um, you know, I 
traveled to Europe a lot over the years for work and, and personally and so on. And the experience uh, assisted by a tool that you can have a conversation with and that can see everything that you can see and, and help you interpret and understand, it changes the experience of, of mm -hmm. travel, you know, and, and forget about what we can do in public relations. It was amazing to go into a restaurant and snap uh, a photo of the menu and then snap a photo in another language of the entire wine list and say, my wife and I are eating this and this, go pick the best bottle of wine for me. We didn't have a bad bottle of wine in our entire vacation. Uh, <laughs> so that was transformative. But, but no, just getting back to your question, I think this is different because the utility and the impact, and again, hopefully um, more uh, positive impact is going to be felt by everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And uh, thank you for that uh, hack, by the way. I haven't tried that. I need to do that. I was in, um, I used right around the same time, a couple of months ago, I was in, in in Greece with my wife for a wedding and we went to the museums there. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a history buff on that end. Uh, but walking around the museum, just snapping pictures of artifacts and getting the stories uh, it was fantastic. I just love yeah. that approach. Um, and translating and learning some Greek along the way was quite nice too. Um, yeah. Also, let's let's dive into the age of AI, right? So you're, you're starting this role uh, recently. Um, you're already working with AI. So, and you're already touched a little bit about how you are approaching AI and how you have this kind of uh, learning you know, growth mindset kind of approach to AI together with your clients. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Where did this kind of, where, and I know your, your, um, CEO has, has made a very uh, public statement that AI is going to be a central part of how you are integrating technology into your agency practices. And how did that decision come about? And, and what are you what are you looking to achieve in the near term? Let's start there. In, in the near term, uh, our, our focus is on two things. N near term impacts are one, um, equipping our people to do work, as I was saying, yeah. um, that, is, that is more effective, but also that makes them happier in their job. That's that's a big goal. We, we have a great culture in our company that's very employee focused. Um, and so that's that's part of the reason. And the other impact near term is we wanna be able to deliver better work for clients and, and get to better results. And that that's the big shift in the last year. Clients want this too. That's right. why they're asking for implementation right now. They, they believe in the opportunity around AI. Now they wanna see the impact, the results of it. Show me how you can get to a better creative output, a better media relations plan. Show me how the results are going to be different. Um, so that's that's really what we're focused on. Long term, you know, the the reason why we um, are investing a lot in this area, reason why I've taken this on as a full time job, is is we we kind of have a philosophy in our company of of of. Um, of, of roofing the building while the sun is shining. And, um, what, you know, we, we see the changes that are happening around us already. We know that, um, our clients are going to be capable of doing things inside their own walls without us in the future. Mm -hmm. And there are things that they're going to need to rely on us for differently in the future too. And so, um, we're in a place right now where our business has been very strong We're you know, our agency has been fortunate to win some really big awards in the South of France recently. And, and things are really good at our company right now. And we see that the world is changing around us and we want to get ahead of those changes um, so that we're not back on our heels, making knee jerk reactions or decisions that won't be good for either our employees or our clients. So we're trying to get ahead of the change that is clearly happening around us and is only accelerating. And so we've set the ambition that in the next two years, um, that our agency is fully integrated across all the things that we do and that all of our people are equipped, not just with tools, but with training, um, that they understand how to use technology in the right ways to make their work better and hopefully make all of them happier along the way too. So it's an investment we're making for the long term. We're also, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out what does the agency of the future look like? Mm -hmm. And again, this is a place where nobody has the answers. Anybody who says they, they right. know exactly what <laughs> an agency should look like two years from now and what, you know, what clients will be looking for. Nobody has the answers yet, but we're, we're gathering as many inputs as we can to make really smart decisions um, along the way. And part of that is, is working really closely with clients right now 
to explore things together. Um, you and I were talking about this a little bit yesterday when we first met, um, that our, our approach right now is not to go to our clients and say, you know, these are the 50 different things we're going to go do in a vacuum for you and how we're going to work differently. Well, we want to, we want to, we, we want to do with our clients and we need to do with our clients is to evolve the way we work alongside of our clients. And so I think the places where we're making the most progress, not just for our agency, but for them, more importantly, is when we are partnering together and we're looking at the work that we do together and we're finding the right ways to start to apply technology and new te techniques to it. And we're testing and we're learning together. So there's a, one of our large clients we're working with right now. Um, we have, we've identi identified probably 25 different use cases across our remit where AI can be assistive to the work that we're doing. Some of it's work that we're doing inside of our walls. Some of it's the work they're doing inside the client organization. Um, but we've identified those use cases. We've worked together to talk about things like risk and mm -hmm. indemnification and all those fun you know, topics that come along sure. with, with the use of AI. But we're working together as really one team to explore the possibilities, figure out where um, truly the work is getting better. People are happier in their jobs. There's a real impact from this. Um, and what places where, you know, we thought maybe AI could be super assistive and we just, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. And, you know, it could be that the technology isn't where it needs to be at, or it may be in some cases, these are just things that inherently they're better left, you know, unassisted, totally human led. Uh, and so we're discovering some of these things um, together with our partners and we're doing it together. And, you know, we have th this, this client that we're working with right now. What I, one of the things I love about our partnership is, is, the, is the openness to discuss what's working and what's not. We have stand-ups with them every week just to talk about what have we learned together? What, what are we super happy with? Wow, this is great. We, we need to keep doing more of this using this tool. This technique is really great. It's unlocked something. And then when things don't go well, we can have that conversation too and say, you know what? We tried it. We're going to move on. That, that's not going to be a part of how we work moving forward. So, you know, the beauty is we're discovering through these individual partnerships with clients, not just how we evolve to support them differently, you know, maybe how we, how we staff our teams differently or how we use tools differently to assist us. But that's also informing um, what our agency might look like in the future too. And so the more and more we have these kinds of really great partnerships with clients, um, the more we can do better work for them quickly in the short run, but also be, be the right kind of, of company for them with the right kinds of solutions in the future too. And that collaboration makes all of that possible. You're right. And you also, you're building your skill within, right? So you can apply this to obviously building this kind of learning, almost like a, like a learning model for yourself and your agency and how you can apply that to customers coming in. You, you, you said before, like last year was a lot about discovery. What is this? Should we fear it? Poking at it. And this year, is it more, as you mentioned, um, more like how can we apply it? Is that generally how you feel the, and what companies are those and how much, how representative are those companies to, you say, the mainstream uh, large cap company out there um, right now? Do you feel like you you helped the cohort from last year really get to a place where they can look at use cases? Tell, tell me about that, because you read polls every day that CMOs are exploring AI, but no one can really, it's quite elusive to understand what exactly they're applying yeah. it for. And uh, it doesn't. And at the same time, they are f a little bit fearful of finding the right use case. And I think that also drills up this kind of media temp, temp, you know, temperament that we have right now, which is more of a AI hype. Is it overvalued? Is it? Uh, it's a feature. Um, yeah. Where are you on all that? Like in terms of your clients and uh, how you how you see the mainstream? Uh, I, I I don't know. This this time of year, you're hearing. Um the phrase don't believe the polls a lot. Um, there, there <laughs> sure. are some really, there's a lot of conflicting data that's out there right now on it. Um, one thing, if you haven't read some of the um, recent research that McKinsey has put out around adoption of Gen AI across businesses, look at what the data shows about application of AI and more and more business functions in every kind of business. It's just happening. And there's, there's really good data that exists out there that suggests it. But, you know, smaller focus group of our clients Absolutely see it. Um, and, and, 
and it's happening because clients have taken some of the early steps over the last 18 months and they've started to see impact in certain areas and now they're ready. They've had a taste of what's possible and they want to look at and explore more and more possibilities. And so that early success is starting to snowball a little bit and there's more appetite to uh, apply it across more of the things that they may do, be doing inside their organization. And that's happening the same for us too. You know, there were, there were certain communities inside of our agency that were faster to embrace some of the tools that we were making available to them. Um, but as you start to see um, some of your peers succeed, it, it creates this sort of flywheel where more and more people are interested. And I believe it's called FOMO, it. just FOMO. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. So, so I, you know, get, just getting back to your original question, I don't, I, I think there are, and, and a lot of the data, the most recent data from really good sources suggest that businesses truly are starting to recognize impact uh, from generative AI in, in different kinds of use cases. And you made this point earlier that we've been using AI in our work for a very long time. I mean, it's been five or 10 years we've been using it in social listening in one form or another. Um, but now just the applications and how we can apply it are just much bigger. So, um, but I, I, in our client organizations, uh, our client partners, um, if they aren't already totally bought in on the potential and the opportunity and the need to explore the right applications for it, they're getting there really, really fast. And what's interesting is it's not just in one category. It's every category of client we work with. Um, even, even in uh, categories that are sometimes slower to embrace change just due to, you know, concerns over risk and things like, like healthcare companies. Um, one, of our, one of our largest healthcare uh, clients came to us in the last couple of weeks um, and, and with a very big ask uh, about how we can accelerate some of the things that we're doing together there. It's, it's, it, I think the demand is becoming universal. Uh, that's incredible to hear, though, that there's an appetite for that kind of progress and solving problems with in a new way. Can, can you break that down a little bit? Because there's so many use cases, right? It's easy to talk quite like, widely about just general application of AI. But what are some, what do you, just tell me like this past six months, perhaps, what are some absolute killer use cases? Is that within supply chain or workflow efficiencies? Or is it on the more of the creative, you know, uh, iteration side or? Yeah, give us some some examples if you have something that yeah, is like yeah. So so if if you think about the work that an agency like ours does, mm -hmm. uh, it, it you know if you really simplify it, it falls into a few different phases. Um, when we're working on a a big a campaign for a brand, it starts with really great uh, research, uh, gathering insights that lead to a really strong strategy. That strong strategy then informs really great creative ideation that leads to awesome content that we can then, you know, distribute to people through social channels or through media relations or influencers and so on, all the way through analytics. What we have, what we have um, been delighted to see over the last couple of years is that in every one of those parts of what we do, um, we're seeing opportunities for AI to make our work a little better, certainly faster. Faster. Mm -hmm. That's you know the, the the efficiency thing is huge. I'll give an example of this. We last year um, we began using in our in our planning community the people who are doing really important research that sort of sets up our campaigns. Um, you know, for an average client program, say we're planning a campaign for a brand, they might spend ten hours gathering, doing research, and gathering research about you know that company, their competitors. Uh, cultural, um, cultural insights, those kinds of things. gathering all of that stuff and then making sense of it so they can distill down for their creative, their partners in creative. What are the three or four like really key insights that we need to build our creative idea on that work would take 10 hours on average, um, roughly for, for most endeavors. Now AI allows our planners to spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes gathering all that research and synthesizing it. Cause AI is just marvelous at doing that kind of work. And they can spend more of their time looking through that the, the summary of insights and pick out the ones that you know truly are the most important um, to be able to share with our creatives to get to better ideas. So that's you know that's allowing us that's a very pragmatic thing that has impacted the way we work. And you know, two years ago, we were spending ten hours uh, right. just on gathering research, not understanding, interpreting, and, and identifying the most important things that we learned that could make our work better. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, you know, I think most of the people in our planning function, if you talk to them, the ones that are really embracing these tools, they're probably a little bit happier in their jobs because at the end of the day, they probably didn't come work for us, you know, to go to go do Google searches all day long. <laughs> what, what they want to be able to do is is to get to, you know, a really sharp insight that they can they can provide to their colleagues and make great work. Uh, so, that, you know, that, that's an example of it. Um, uh, media relations is an area where um, there are lots of emerging use cases right now, but over the last 18 months, two years, you know, the, the work that we can do on understanding what journalists actually care about and then making sure that the stories our clients want to tell um, are relevant to those journalists, AI is magical in helping us do that. Um, you know, clients come to us typically and they say, we're launching a new product. And, you know, we've got a story to tell about that. We want to earn, earn attention in the marketplace around this new product. Um, what AI helps us do now on the media relations side is understand what's happening in culture, what journalists are reporting on, and how that relates to the news or the story that we've got to tell. And how do we bring those two things together really well? And, and that's a time intensive thing to do. Uh, and it's allowing our, our, our media relations pros uh, to spend more time really like refining the story. Uh, as opposed to understanding, okay, what did 500 journalists write about most last last month, or what you know, what's appearing most in headlines that we should probably build around our story because it's relevant to what journalists care about. You know, that's that's another sort of pragmatic example of how it is changing how our uh, how our work gets done, and then all the way through to measurement. Um, what's amazing about what we can do today, we couldn't do as well a couple of years ago, is be able to gather insights that either make our work better uh, in real time or prove the impact of what we've done. And so, you know, now we can, we can, with the help of AI, you know, we can prove the business impact of what we've done. You know, all of this um, media coverage that we may have generated for a client or social conversation that we've helped, helped uh, spark, how does that equate to sales? Now with AI, we can correlate what we do, even in the earned disciplines, a lot better to um, end really important business outcomes um, like conversion or sales. And so those are those are just some pragmatic things. But you know, even the softer side of what we do, account management, you know, budgeting for clients, um, resource management on teams, um, simple stuff like um, writing employee reviews. You know, being able to gather three hundred and sixty feedback from. 30 people on a team and be able to really sort of synthesize that into themes and help coach employees on, you know, this is really kind of a common thread that in our areas for improvement, your colleagues talk about, yeah, I can help us do that so much better um, than, than maybe we could with finite amount of time. So it's really is, it's, 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 it's impacting lots and lots of parts of what we do. Uh, it's, yeah, that's incredible. That's quite a wide spectrum of different activities. So you can, and you're still, hiring you are like how is how do you how do you use this you know within because we talked about it earlier there is a bit fear in there it doesn't seem like that exists with the philosophy that you have obviously um but it's out there how do you how do you approach that internally and how do you tell you know you're still hiring and what are you hiring for what do you what do you need is it the creative brain power to be able to yeah. apply all these things we're just getting more and more productive with ai basically and yeah, I mean, we, just, I mean, we still need humans to do it do the ideation and execution i guess yeah yeah i mean there are definitely productivity gains mm. and you know in the future it, it may change how we staff teams a little bit or you know when you win a new piece of business or a client hands you a you know big assignment how you would staff that might be different mm. um but yeah no we're we're continuing to hire people in in conventional roles but the skill sets we're looking for and some of those people are starting Mm. to evolve one of Mm. my great friends in our company is our chief creative officer in asia and he works out of singapore and i remember him telling me you know again middle of last year um he said how i hire and what i look for now in a creative is different i've always looked for people who have an awesome book you know campaigns that that I, I know that have been in culture that have won awards and, and they've got a good book of work. Um, but now I'm also um, looking for evidence that they understand how to use modern technology mm-hmm. to get that work done better and smarter and to maybe even take them into new creative directions. And so he's, you know, he's looking for people that are somewhat left brained and right brained at the same time that have, 
you know, traditional human creative skills, but also understand how to use technology uh, to supercharge what they as humans are best suited to do. So we're looking for different kinds of skill sets in the same role. The other thing, the other thing that we've, we've kind of learned and, and I think, uh, you know, uh, many of us maybe thought that as AI was beginning to take hold, um, that it would, it would largely be our younger employees that are part of our teams that would be driving uh, uptake of it and how we used it and figuring out how we use it in the right ways. And absolutely, um, our younger employees were often the first to be using AI. They were using it certainly in their personal lives before some of our um, more, more senior um, uh, uh, leaders were. But what we found over the last year is the uh, sometimes the most effective use of AI is um, through an understanding of how that work gets done without AI. And what, what I mean by that is, you know, we, I'll give you a, pr a practical example. We've been building out lots and lots of prompting guides to help our employees who are in a certain role understand how to use technology and prompt it to do this bit of work that you do every day. And, and the best people to help us figure out those prompts are the people who have been doing that work for a long time and understand the right questions to ask. Because prompting is essentially instructions or questions, right? And I'll use planning as an example. Um, you know, we have people that have been doing planning work, which includes a lot of heavy research, asking the right questions to get to great insights. It's the people who have done that work and know the right questions to ask are the ones who can help us and help train up the next generation of those leaders on the right prompts to use inside of AI. So it really is, um, you know, people, um, uh, that, that may be using it, um, uh, in their personal lives or, or, or. Uh, in other endeavors outside of work, they may be more comfortable with the technology, uh, along with people who have maybe been in a craft longer that understand the key questions to ask. If you could bring those two people together, um, then it's kind of magic that that um, can be creative. It can be created. Uh, that's always hard, right? New technology and existing workflows and teaching an old dog, that, that whole thing, um, change management, right? Be able to do that. But it seems like you invest a lot in training and getting everyone on board to be able to kind of move forward together, which is, uh, uh, seems like the right thing to do. Um, so you don't get stuck in old ways in when everything is moving so fast. How are you, how are you testing out? There's so many, obviously large language models out there, application layer, um, software to try out. How do you put that in practice? Do you search for them? Do you have people just testing things out and see what's working? And then you kind of onboard it or recommend it to clients. How do you approach all this te technology happening? I mean, I just read Anthropic is starting a hundred million dollar fund to just uh, get more startups in the game. So it's just gonna, it's just gonna be more and more, right? How do you, how do you, um, how do you operationalize that on your end? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I would say in the early days of our exploration, it was a little bit wild west, and it was just lots of people going out and finding shiny things and and trying them out, and it was word of mouth. Somebody discovered something amazing you could do with this tool, and they would share it with a colleague, and so on. Um, as 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 our approach has matured, we've added more structure into the way we do that kind of exploration. And what we start with is always um, the business problem we're trying to solve or the communications. Mm -hmm problem we're trying to solve, if it's a client program we're working on, uh, or the opportunity. Mm. And so we'll look, you know, one of the things we did last year that was super helpful is to look across all of our craft communities, you know, planners and creatives and media relations people and influencer pros, social experts, you get the idea, lots of different people. Um, what is it about their work um, that can become cumbersome, that's super time intensive, that may not be super strategic and where are the areas of their work where they just don't sometimes have enough time to do that work really well. And so where we started to look and where we, where we generally begin to look for solutions is where can we solve the stuff over here to allow people to do the higher impact work and the stuff they probably want to do more of anyway, because it's more fulfilling. That's where we're, we're beginning. So we, so we have identified what those uh, challenges or opportunities are um, within each of the craft communities. And we're trying to match technologies against those specific needs, as opposed to just saying, oh, we saw this today and it's sort of interesting and maybe there's an application for it. We're starting first with what we need or what we need to do more of as humans and then where can, can technology assist it. So 
we're trying to do it in a, in a, in a kind of a structured way. Um, and it's, it's the same thing when, when we're embracing AI together with our clients. One of the first things that we do is sit down together and look at what is the nature of our work together? What's in our statements of work? And have an honest conversation about where are we spending um, our time and you, client, your money um, that maybe we could use AI to assist us in some of that so that we can do more of this thing over here that you want us to do more of because it delivers more value for your impact. So that's another great thing about this sort of evolution that's happening. It's prompting really great conversations with clients to say, what is it you value most from us and what can we deliver more of and what do we need to change and how do we need to evolve? It's, it's sparking those kinds of conversations. Um, but, but no, the, the, the te technology side of it, staying on top of what's available and what's going to be impactful. That's hard. It's hard because it's moving so, so fast. Um, but yeah, we're, we have people inside, um, that help us do that. We're fortunate to be part of a, a larger holding company and there are lots of other, I have peers at our other agencies. They're doing the same kind of work and exploration. And so we share a lot of what we're learning. You know, even somebody that might work at a media buying agency, they might be learning something about a tool or a technology that could impact what we do. So we, there's a lot of that dot connecting and sharing um, that happens across um, the company, the, the larger company that I work for called Interpublic Group. Right. Yeah, yeah, very familiar. You're part of IPG. Um... <sighs> So what does the future hold here, Jeff? What are, what are some things in the near term that you are excited about in the AI space that have, hasn't really arrived yet? That, I mean, we see some of these things are evolving so incredibly quickly. You know, I, I just watched it the other day again, you know, Will Smith eating spaghetti a year ago in AI, <laughs> and now yeah. look at it, right? Um, yeah. So what do you think is the next leg of our journey within AI here to unlock yeah. this human creativity? Yeah, I, I, several things. One is I, I think we um, have begun to see the impact that um, AI platforms that focus on text input and output through text and what you can get back. You know, we rolled out uh, Microsoft Copilot to all of our employees around the world last year. Um, and the ability to have a safe, secure, end to end encrypted, doesn't train the model uh, chatbot. Um, and have that on everybody's desktop that that is that is making um a a big big impact and in, in our work around the world um right now what i'm what i'm more excited about is as we move beyond just text inputs and outputs back to our teams um into text to more immersive content outputs truly generative video so we're one of our uh, largest global clients is Adobe, and we've been working with them um, as a communications partner to help introduce the creative world to Firefly, all of their right. generative AI technologies. And uh, it's amazing what you can do with text to photography, but what's coming next in terms of text to video, and we're starting to see little examples of brands beginning to experiment with this. Mm -hmm. You've probably seen some stuff um, recently from Toys R Us and Motorola, where a lot of the content is beginning to be um, uh, generated by AI, it's it's amazing to go beyond just flat text into more immersive mm -hmm. formats. That's one thing I'm super excited about. The other thing that's changing is the way that we are interacting with these intelligent agents. Um, that's super exciting to me too. So again, instead of somebody having to have a conversation through a with a chat bot through a back and forth, uh, there is much more intuitive conversation and assistance changes when you can truly have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if um, if you haven't yet played with some of the emerging tech that's been released in the last month by some of the biggest players, there are new opportunities to sit in a room and have a conversation with your device. Uh, and that device can basically play the role of a seasoned expert in whatever field you're in. And you can sit in a conference room and as, as opposed to typing something to a chat bot, have a conversation with you know, basically a virtual employee that you've hired to have a conversation to brainstorm and think things through. So that's useful, you know, crisis management situation, for example. Imagine if you're sitting in a room and we have lots of brilliant credentialed, you know, experienced crisis managers in our company, but sometimes some of them are busy and working on other things and you just need an extra brain. Now you can sit in a room and have a conversation with real-time thoughtful responses through your voice to think through 
it, it changes how you solve problems. So I'm really excited about the different ways that we're going to act, interact um, with these technologies. And then the last thing I'm excited about, uh, among the many things I'm excited about, is is um, you know today a lot of the um, a lot of the early momentum in AI is around um, licensing third party tools that are trained on public models and getting them into hands of our teams who can use them safely, effectively, and do that quickly because it's, it's making an instant impact on our work. What I'm more excited about in the future though, is um, it is becoming easier and easier for a company like mine to take what we know and the data that we create through our work every day um, and to begin to understand what we're learning through our work um, in, in, in the various areas we do work and, and pool all that information together and then add AI on top of it to unlock some of that knowledge and, and to take the experience we have as an agency of thousands of people and to make that accessible to every person. That makes all of us better in our work. And so, you know, developing more proprietary solutions based on our own data, um, we're going to be doing a lot more of that in the future because it's getting easier for everybody to do that kind of work. I'm really excited about that. Bring our own unique solutions to life, not just the best tech that is available through awesome third-party partners. It seems like that is certainly a direction that it seems like they're, we're headed, like everyone created, creating their own kind of brain. Because we're still in this market right now where uh, training data is a little um, sketchy at, at times, and well, not sketchy perhaps, but a lot of the big models are, um, they kind of have to reveal how they're do, using their training data. And, and the, the lines are a little blurred there, right? I'm not saying anyone is right or wrong, because uh, I don't know. But it seems like there, is, there will be a kind of a, a result of that, that people kind of create their own, their own brains or their own models, if you will, that you can apply. But what does that, what does that, what does that kind of look like in 10 years? What's the goal, the goal in AI model? Yeah. What, where, okay. Well, this, this, this is, this paint is us a picture, paint us a picture. Well, that's an example where I don't have the answers yet. Um, <laughs> that's probably the right answer. Yeah. Yeah. It probably yeah. is. Um, I, I do think, I do think directionally, we know that um, one, first and foremost, humans are always going to be in charge of our work. Um, I, I don't, I don't believe that in the next ten years there are going to be a lot of things that, that increasing number of things that AI can assist our people to do. But fundamentally, you need a human being with intuition, experience, humanity, empathy on top of all that, evaluating what's coming out of assistive tools to make great decisions for clients. Clients in my world have a lot more comfort hiring trusted human beings than they probably will trusted computing systems from agencies or even what they buy inside. So that, like they're hiring us for experience and trust. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the um, I think we will absolutely get to a place where um, there's a lot more sharing of information across entities um, to build very unique problem solving agents. What I mean by that is an agency like mine will have our own data lake of the things that we do and what we learn from our work every day across our employee population. We're going to be bringing in data from other third parties. So for example, an interpublic group, one of my sister agencies is Axiom and they have really great granular information on a couple billion consumers around the, the world. It would be amazing. And now it's possible to bring in information on consumers to help personalize what we're doing in public relations, right? I can bring that data in. But then also, um, all of our clients have been amassing data um, about their businesses and, you know, their customers have been sharing more data with these companies that they've been gathering over the years. Now that can be um, used and shared with all of uh, the agencies that a company may work with to enrich how we can work on their behalf. You know, it's not uncommon today for for um, clients to share lots of information with their media buying partner. But right. you know, in the in the earned media disciplines, it's not as commonplace um, for a company to be sharing certain slices of data to drive decision making. Now, um, I, I think that's going to become more common. And then what you're going to see is more and more innovation um, that, that that is done inside of organizations to solve problems. And so we're all going to have different mousetraps and different things that we can bring to the table. And so it's not just, you know, I think what people are going to be hiring in agencies for the future is not just smart people, but smart solutions that are um, mm -hmm. supported by tech. 
um, that is that is proprietary um, to those organizations. I think that's where we're headed. Well, that's that's a future view. That sounds pretty good. It's going to be an interesting uh, thing to see evolve. I feel like ten years from now feels like so long from where we are now, and yes. so many things will happen. Just look at your twenty year career. What what's um, uh, what just in the digital practice at Golan? Um, how much has happened? It's kind of kind of wild. I gotta say, I I, I was home alone. Uh, my kids were, were out with their grandparents. My wife was traveling. And this happens like once every five years that I'm home alone. Yeah. And I actually started talking to ChatGPT just to have a little company. A little sad, a little sad perhaps, uh, but I, <laughs> I really enjoy it. It's a, it's a very new way. It's kind of a new form factor to really uh, get information, right? That's, that's quite unique. And I think we're yeah. talking about, I mean, we're in the audio space and we're on a podcast here. Audio is, is certainly part of, of, of our media consumption. And I think that will evolve quite a lot in so yeah. many new ways with hyper personalized information uh, freely flowing. So I'm, I'm here for that. I think it's going to be really interesting. I've, we've been holding you for a long time here. This has been so much fun. You're a uh, very, very fascinating um, career behind you. And I feel like you're stepping into something even more exciting in many ways um, that we don't know much about. But I'm I'm really keen to um, to see where you're taking this and see the whole space evolve and what you do over at Golan. It's really, really, really fun to see. Before we part ways, I want to I want to hear some some um, uh, two two more questions for you. Okay. What what music, podcast, or audiobook is in your earbuds these days? Okay. Um, oh, good good question. All right. Uh, I'll give you a couple things that I find interesting on the topic of AI. I'll just keep it focus there. Um, uh, <laughs> it's your whole world now. It's, yeah, it's going it's it to take over your grill. It's going to take over your barbecue skills. It's going to be yeah, uh, it, all over. It will. Um, I would say there's, there's a newsletter I read, I subscribe to that I found to be a really great kind of roll up of what's happening in the world of AI. It's called Ben's Bytes newsletter. I'm not being paid as a, um, uh, as a spokesperson for this publication. It's a great read. Um, so, so take a look at that. Um, the, uh, a colleague of mine recently turned me on to a podcast called The Artificial Intelligence Show uh, mm. by a guy named Paul Rotzer um, that is really great. There's like 100 episodes, I think, on it now and lots of really interesting, easy to listen to content about how our world is changing around us. And then if you like bite size, mm. uh, and he doesn't like bite size, <laughs> if you spend time on Instagram, um, uh, check out Evolving AI. Okay. It is great um, because instead of just reading about how AI is changing, it's a lot of really visual content videos um, to see like real world outputs and what's becoming possible with AI. I love it. It's just, it's the one thing I'll find in my Instagram feed outside of, you know, cute puppies and pictures of <laughs> everybody else's kids um, that I, that I really love. That's that sort of business focus. So check that out. Those are three good ones. Amazing. I think we can, we can uh, throw some links in the show notes for people to okay. find it. I think that's good. Good to give some shout outs there. All right, last question. We touched on this before, but I'm really, yeah. really curious about this because I have children of my own uh, and you have an amazing career. If you would give advice to the generation graduating now or heading into college who wants to follow your career path, what would you advise them to do? Yeah, um, good questions. Uh, I've had I've had the, the pleasure of working with some really great people Al Golan being one of them for part of my career and um, been able to get a lot of really great advice from people on the way. Um, just coming back to the topic we talked about earlier, curiosity is huge. Curiosity will fuel so much of your career. And then figuring out, you know, when your curiosity is linked to a passion, something you're, you're truly interested in yourself, and you can figure out how that interest or passion uh, can intersect with your day job and what somebody mm -hmm. will pay you to do. Um, then work doesn't become work. And, um, and, and so, you know, following, finding a passion, um, specializing a bit, having something you're focused on that is maybe different than what the three other colleagues sitting next to you were focused on or now bring something different to the table. Um, that's always huge. And, um, you know, I think um, humility is something that is often rare um, in the business world today, especially in the sort of the culture we find ourselves in. And um, it's refreshing when you find people who have a little bit of humility. And, um, and I think 
that builds trust with people and allows you to get things done when you're honest and upfront and you tell people what you know and you don't know. So I think all of those things are, are super helpful, but find something you love to do. You know, I've got a kid who's going to college soon and I'm getting ready to write a bunch of big checks for college bills. And, you know, the conversation has come up, wait a minute, are, are we picking majors and classes and things that are going to be useful when you get from out of school four years from now or five years from now? Um, and you know, where we keep adding out is find the things that stimulate you and keep you interested and excited. And no matter how technology changes the day to day of a job, you'll always find something that's valuable and fulfilling. There's always a role for humanity and, and, and any job, regardless of where AI goes in the future. And if you find something you love to do and you can figure out how to bring that into your career, everything will be fine. So first and foremost, Find stuff that interests you personally. Solid advice. I think we leave with that. There's always room for humanity in the future. I, um, I love that. Jeff, it's been a pleasure. It's so nice to meet you. And thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing all this amazing information about what you're doing as your, your chief AI officer job and how you're building that discipline, how you work with clients. I feel like I learned a ton about how the, the curiosity exists there among companies as well. Uh, with a dash of FOMO, a lot of progress will happen, I guess. Um, to get to get a lot of these solutions on the ground. And again, I take it with me this optimism of that creativity does exist in a world of AI and yeah. it kind of uh, thrives um, in the world of AI. Um, and I, I, I hope we're both right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank Thanks you so up. much, Jeff. Pleasure. Thank you for watching and listening to Makes You Wonder. If you enjoyed this episode, do us a solid and hit that subscribe button on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Amazon, or wherever you get your podcasts. For extra karma, please share with your mom and your friends too. Makes You Wonder is made with love by Wondercraft, the AI audio studio for brands and creative teams. It's hosted by Oscar Sarander. You can find Oscar on LinkedIn, X, and Threads. Links in show notes. This episode was produced by Alex Hughes Morgan. It was edited by Zena. A nice young man named Dimitri from Wondercraft was the executive producer. Learn more about Wondercraft at wondercraft.ai.